Hello, friends, and happy Friday. It is the Friday Conversation episode 90-something. I always get the number wrong, so I won't try. But today we're going to try to... 95. Today we're going to try to discuss storytelling. We're trying to have a come a different topic. And storytelling is going to be... I think it's a wide range of topics we could talk about. Maybe not as many as characters, but maybe maybe it is. We'll find out. Susanna, will you start us off with an introduction? Glad you can make it. Yeah. Uh, hello, uh, my name is Susanna Imaginario. I, I'm a writer and sometimes YouTuber at the end of the weird. And I'm really glad to be here. Thank you for inviting me. <laughs> glad you made it. And Jose. Uh, hi, I'm Jose. I run the Jose's Amazing World uh, YouTube channel. And uh, in the past, I've dabbled in writing. More than dabbled, I would say. You've, you, you know, you've published a book, two books. I mean, it's more than dabble. That is definitely more than dabbling. Let's, let's leave it at that. Let's just... <laughs> and uh, Carl. And yeah, I am Carl D. Albert, a uh, member of the Page Chewing Forum and uh, an indie fantasy author. Nice. Yes, reading that one now. Uh, so, so storytelling, I think is, you can, there's a, you can do a, I think storytelling is kind of a general term for, you know, telling stories, but I think there's a lot, you can, there's a whole lot of things you can do with storytelling. I think storytelling, we've been telling stories since the beginning of time, I would guess, just, you know, telling each other stories and, finding common ground with each other or not there are not two, but so what does everyone, or I guess we could start with since you were all authors, published authors, all three of you, how do we tell a story? I guess the good place to start. Once upon a time. <laughs> it was a dark and stormy uh, night. Yeah. yeah, there you go. Uh, well, it depends on, on the story <laughs> that you want to tell. Um, but yeah. I, I'll, I'll confess to joining this conversation and having no idea how the hell to define storytelling. Mm -hmm. Other than I'm like, it's the thing that people do. Um, it's when they tell stories. <laughs> this is one of those, like, I, I feel like a common refrain is, um, particularly around like topics of, you know, novel writing or short story writing, prose writing, that there are authors who are, for whatever reason, referred to as like not good writers, but good storytellers. Mm. And I never understand what that means. Like, this is just a thing that I've seen on the internet um, many, many, many times. Um, I've heard Stephen King refer to that, which I think is, um, I forget, can we curse on this? Hmm. Mm -hmm. BS is what I'm getting at. Um, but I, <laughs> I, I, I don't... I don't know. I don't, uh, you know, beyond just like the ability to spin a yarn that entertains someone. But like you said, Steve, you know, that encompasses a lot of topics, you know, uh, different stories engage with people in different ways. And so I, I don't this I'm very curious to hear what everyone else has to say or if they have uh, distinct definitions about, you know, what they think of when they think of storytelling. Well, I, I've, I've heard that, that, you know, a good writer or a good storyteller and not a good writer. Um, and, and I agree. I mean, storytelling is not just about writing, but for the sake of this discussion, we're just going to talk about writing because if we start getting into, you know, uh, cinema and theater and uh, cave art painting, uh, we, we'll, we will never, uh, it's going to last all night. <laughs> but... Um, yeah, sometimes I, I notice that, you know, I read books that um, the story is good, the writing is not. Hmm. And the other way around, books where uh, the writing is really good, but the story is eh. And um, how the book is presented, it changes a lot. Like for me, some stories or some books work very well as an audiobook. You know, I... I couldn't read the book, I start the audiobook, and I continue. And vice versa, books that I love, I cannot listen to the narration. If it had been the other way around, I would probably DNF. So it's it's complicated. I'm trying to 
think of specific examples for each one. And while I'm doing that, someone else gives their opinion, please. Uh, I think if we're talking about storytelling, like I think I think we are differentiating between the content and the and the way in which the story in which the content is presented, right? So I think um, I was thinking about the Tom Cruise movies of the 80s, early 90s, they were all effectively the same story. They were just told differently, isn't it? Mm. But um, Days of Thunder, Cocktail, Top Gun, they're all the same story. You know, Maverick in his field has a crisis of confidence, meets a woman, brings him out of that crisis of confidence, comes back, is a winner. And every single Tom Cruise movie from the 80s and 90s was the same story just the way they were told is what made it different. Hmm. And I think um, it goes back to, uh, I'm sure Carl knows this, the, the, there are effectively only however many sto universal stories. There, there's only like, you know, the, you go back to the Greek, to the, to the classics, there's effectively only like a, a bunch of stories and all we're doing is retelling the same story. And all we change is the set, or we change is the setting, or the character, or or whatever it is. Um, so Kurt Vonnegut it, is is famous for having a theory about. I, I I studied it in film school. He had like six story structures. Hmm. Um, I, I I could be wrong on the number, but it's something around six. Um, that yeah, I I that's something I've always um, chafed against. I I feel like. There are definitely more than that, um, but it's it's certainly. I do think that there is an element of truth to it that a lot of stories are at their core the same, you know, telling the same kind of story. But it's you know it's the setting, it's the character, it's whatever you know that differentiates it in the details. I guess. Um, yeah, I, I'm. I definitely. I feel like how you guys have been defining it is is sort of how I understood it. The the thing that I also chafe against is just the idea that like the way the story is told to me is fundamentally tied to the story itself. And I, I guess you could have, you know, beautiful prose. I mean, is I guess is that the difference? Is it just a matter of like if we're talking about strictly like prose writing, it's the quality of prose versus the actual like plot and characters and what have you. Like, is that the differentiation on how, what we're talking about when we're talking about storytelling? Um, and that it's, you know, the prose is ultimately um, not secondary, but just separate from the rest. Because uh, that's the thing that I, I, I don't know. I, I find it um, hard for me, at least personally. I mean, maybe this just speaks to, like, my approach as a writer. But I feel like uh, anytime I try to tell a story, I'm very much conscious of the way that I'm telling the story and that it is all tied together. Um, but I certainly do feel like that there are authors whose, you know, prose may be lacking, but who, uh, you know, have a, a plot twists and characters and things like that that really engage me. And so I enjoy their books nonetheless. Um, but yeah, going off that, whatever you guys want to say in response to that. No, I think you've expressed in much better words what I was trying to so clumsily get out. I think I think that's how we interpret things in in the context that we're talking about. In, in terms of, I, I suppose we're sticking to written storytelling. No, right? you could, but yeah. Yes, yeah. Well, I don't know how far off track do you want to get? I guess. <laughs> but go for it. Yeah, we'll see where it takes us. Well, I'm here looking at uh, you know Google's first def definition of storytelling, first thing that shows up, and, and then, anyway. Uh, so the vivid description of ideas, beliefs, personal experiences, and life lessons through stories or narratives that evoke powerful emotions and insights. So to me, the key, um, the key definition here is just it has to evoke powerful emotions and insights, otherwise it's just a report. Hmm. You know, that 
that is what makes a story a story. It has that element of uh, creativity, of uh, um, a different structure than just, yeah, I went grocery shopping, uh, bought milk and eggs and came home and boiled them and then wrote about uh, <laughs> how they look. <laughs> you see, boring as hell, you know, it's, even though it is a story, but uh, there's nothing there. So for a story to work, it needs to have conflict. It needs to have an in, what they call the inciting uh, incident or inciting incident, something like that. Sorry, my English today yep. is... Friday night, too late. Um, you're spot on. No, you're doing great. So it, something to grab the listener. So I, I read somewhere that a good storyteller needs to also be a good listener. Mm-hmm. Um, and you, you need to, to get the, the audience attention. You have to make the reader or listener feel something about what is going on. Even the most mundane thing, like going to the, to the grocery shop has to be presented in in a way that makes it engaging. And that could be done through beautiful prose, if you have the skill, thumbs up, or you just create a series of obstacles and bizarre things that happen along the way or in a grocery shop or whatever. So that is more of the, the talent, let's say, of telling a story to make it more interesting. And Jose, you brought up the the Tom Cruise thing. I, I never really thought of it that way, but you're right. It is like a carbon copy. A lot of those movies are just the same story, just in different settings and different problems. But I wonder, and, and Carly mentioned about Vonnegut having like six different kind of templates or, you know, storytelling. I, I looked up just to check too. It's eight. Oh, okay. So to correct myself earlier, it is eight story shapes. Story shapes. Um, story. But yes, that's how he describes it. Anyway, go. Uh, you, and by the way, you can find his lecture on this mm-hmm. online. I mean, it's written about everywhere, but there's like literally a YouTube video where he uh, talks about it. It's very poor quality, but uh, you can see exactly. He draws the story uh, shapes out. I mean, it's literally he graphs it. And I mean, clearly Kurt Vonnegut is a, a very smart, very uh, talented, influential author. So, you know, he, you should take what he says seriously, even if, like me, you maybe disagree with some aspects of it but anyway sorry go go on steve no i was just gonna ask i i wonder if 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 there's certain there's certain ways of telling a story certain stories we 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 gravitate towards consciously or subconsciously because we we want we don't want to be surprised we just kind of want the same story we want to we want the same story again and again because it's like a comfort thing is that I don't know if there's anything to that that we kind of walk into a walk into days of thunder knowing it's going to be a co- copy of Top Gun and Cocktail, and that's okay. Like that's maybe we're searching for something that is predictable, and we kind of know where things are going to go, and maybe that's an escape from life where we don't know what's going to happen ten minutes from now. Well, that's Hollywood's bread and butter, right? I mean, not to keep going back to movies, but that's why you know you you get executives that constantly you know there's talk about like four quadrants you know it's like um older people like adult men adult women and like young people i think are the four quadrant and um you you know you want to hit them all and so often that means telling the same types of stories over and over and over again um and i and i think there's absolutely truth to that you know we were talking about before starting this uh the genre of erotica i don't think people who are reading erotica are wanting wildly different experiences every time they're just wanting you know to get their rocks off um and nothing wrong with that that's not to like dismiss it uh it's just you know i think that's generally true i think a lot of fantasy readers you know want often the hero's journey sort of type of story um, certainly this is all generalization. Um, there are exceptions to every rule, but there, there definitely is a lot of truth to what you're saying, Steve, I think. Yeah, we are hardwired to like stories, to enjoy stories. Our society communication is built upon stories from, um, you know, things that we don't even think that they're stories, but for example, currency, you know, money, you know, if you... You are telling a story, 
if, if you give me this or do that, I will give you this piece of paper in payment. It, it is, we are attributing a value to, to this thing and you are, how to put it? If you went to a monkey and, uh, you know, and you say, well, uh, if you, I'll give you um, a banana if you do this thing for me and he's seeing the banana, you know, and he's going to do it. If you just tell him, you know, promise a banana and the banana is not there and he's probably going to be like, yeah, I, I, I don't believe you. I, I, I need to see it. We believe you know, if someone tells us that uh, they're going to give us a banana, if we do something, we do, because we are hardwired to believe in stories, to believe in lies. And that's mm. another saying about storytelling. And I think it's Neil Gaiman or Alan Moore. I think Neil Gaiman stole from Alan Moore. I don't know, one of the two. I'm paraphrasing because <laughs> I can't quote either. That um, telling stories or so- storytelling is telling truth through lies or lying to tell the truth, something like that. And um, yeah, I think I think it's true. I believe mm. that story. <laughs> no, too much, <laughs> too early. <laughs> no, it's good. I mean, jumping in, I guess. Uh, while we're talking, I have it pulled up, so I might as well just like mention it. Um, the eight kind of story shapes that Kurt Vonnegut uh, describes since we were talking about this earlier is man in a hole. And so if you imagine, I actually have a whiteboard, but I probably, I'm not going to try to make this um, a whole thing. Uh, That that would be a disaster. Uh, But man in a hole, which is like someone starts out pretty high, uh, then something horrible happens and, you know, their life sucks and they're in a hole theoretically, right? And then they climb their way back out of the hole and go higher, you know, they end up even better than where they started it, right? Um, boy meets girl, which is like, uh, life's okay. It's fine. Oh, you know, the boy meets the girl. So it starts to be great. And then conflict happens and they break up and life gets terrible and it's worse than it's ever been. And then they get back together again and it's infinitely amazing and perfect, um, from bad to worse, which is just like things start rough and they only get worse. It's terrible. Um, which way is up, uh, which is just kind of this chaotic, jumble of like what the hell is going on um and then the creation story which is you know you start with nothing and things just get better and better and better um the old testament which uh is like things start okay they're improving it's getting you know gradually better and then some terrible tragedy happens and everything is complete shit and it ends shit and then uh new testament which is the same sort of structure as Old Testament, except things get really great at the end and it's infinitely better at the end. Mm. You know, Jesus comes back and saves everyone's souls and everyone goes to heaven. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and then Cinderella, which is like things start really shit and then they get better because she goes to the ball and she meets Prince Charming, but then she's back and she's miserable because she's like, I'm just going to live as, you know, and be abused by my stepsisters forever. Um, but then the Prince Charming comes and loves her and, you know, happy ever after everything is infinitely better. And these are like drawn out. I did crap. I'm doing with my hands. It's like trying to imitate the sort of the, the shape of the story. Right. Um, so again, I encourage people to look it up because you can actually like better see it better than me doing like hand puppets. Um, but it's, uh, that's sort of the idea is, you know, that, that all of these stories, you know, going back to what Jose uh, was originally saying towards the beginning, have like the same kind of general structure um, and that these are the structures that just naturally engage us as human beings. Um, and they're the stories we tell over and over again, um, even if they are like widely different contexts. Um, and, and I don't know. Uh Again, I've, I've expressed my own um, conflicted feelings about the notion, but uh, I don't know if you guys have any thoughts about think, these supposed yeah. universal story structures. I, no, I think they are universal structures. It doesn't mean to say they are the only structures, but I think they do resonate. And, and, the, and you know, the fact that we have so many iterations of those same stories over time speak to that, you know, our testament to that universality. But, but I don't think it's meant to be reductive and that we only have eight stories and that everything is, is that. 
Um, I think I, you're right. I, I agree with that. I do think there's a universality. It, it's that, yeah, it's when it gets reductive that I start to, and yeah. I don't, I, I'm not sure if Kurt, certainly the way it was taught to me was kind of reductive. Um, but I don't know what Kurt Vonnegut ultimately. But, but, but the thing is, maybe it's an easy mistake to make that jump to go from these are eight universal stories to these are the eight universal mm -hmm. stories. And again, we come from a, you know, Western European tradition. And I know nothing about, you know, the very rich, you know, ancient Chinese or Indian culture. Maybe there are other stories that are universal in other cultures that we are unaware of. So, you know, because very clearly, I don't know how you could fit, you know, coming back to movies again, but something like Pulp Fiction into those Kurt Vonnegut. And, and you know, I think you know, it's a great story. Is it not? I don't know. But we, I'm sure we can all find very clearly examples of a story that do not fit those categories. So what, how I was taught Pulp Fiction, because that, that's one that d did come up in, in film school a lot, was that it is one of, I don't remember which story structure it was, but that was one of the ones that was taught in class. It's just told out of order. Mm. It's that the chapters were rearranged. I, I, I was going to say that, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right. But but then, so, so that, that goes back to what we were talking about of... Um, separating the how we tell the story to the underlying conceptual story mm. isn't it is it i think when we have some i'm so glad you brought up pulp fiction because i think when we have a film like pulp fiction at the time was you know kind of you know at the time it was like whoa what's going on here um but is it easier to break those storytelling um molds in cinema than it is in books because if you're reading pulp if you just read pulp fiction you'd be really confused and i think it would appeal to a very small sub section of readers where in film you can see the characters you can see the environments you you can tell this character is hurt or they're older or they're younger or whatever so it, is it easier to break those molds in cinema where we have visual aids to guide us than it is in something like in text Absolutely. Yes. Mm. I do think it's easier. I, I don't think it's impossible, though. Um, you know, I think a, a lot of, like, particularly the literary fiction, um, going beyond the, like, kind of generic, you know, college professor wants to sleep with undergrads and hates his life and that sort of thing thing you know type of literary story uh, a lot of literary fiction i have found particularly in the last like 100 years um tries to play with story structure a lot in the way it's told in chronology um and so i think i mean i can't think of a book off the top of my head um which i guess in some ways does indicate you know that it certainly doesn't happen as often as it does in say movies although it's not common in movies either i mean i think christopher nolan is famous for it um, and certainly Quentin Tarantino with Pulp Fiction. Um, but I, I do think it's easier in movies, but I, I don't know that it's impossible. You just have to be very careful about, again, like how you describe the characters or how you, um, you know, or just like signpost it, right? It, talk about like, oh, it's, you know, month what and year what mm. or whatever. Or, um, I mean, you think of how Pulp Fiction does it. They, It's like in chapters, basically. And I, I think you could literally do the same thing in books um i don't know i mean it's that's certainly an, uh, an interesting idea and, and yeah i do think it's easier in movies just because like you said the visual cues that you can latch on to yeah <clears throat> it's, think, it's it's much easier right. oh sorry i was going to give an example uh, it is much easier in movies because you have a lot more cues in, in books uh, it it demands the reader to be a bit more patient to really try to understand what is going on. And, you know, you will probably need a little more info dumps along the way to kind of make sense. So a good example of that is Cloud Atlas. Hmm. The book, That's, yeah. it's uh, the stories, it's six stories, and they are split in two throughout the book. The movie splits them a lot more. Um, and connects them not just um, visually, but th th uh, thematically 
So it's it's more of a feel from story to story, and and many people can't watch it because uh, you know the so-called inciting um, and, and inciting incident happens like forty odd minutes into the movie, because all that time is setting up. It's the, all the different stories being set up in the very shortcuts. And, um, and and it's beautiful to me. It's it's amazing. But you couldn't do that in a book. You know, the book does it very well for a book, but the movie took it a step further because it, it just has the means to show a lot more, a lot quicker than the author can do on a page. Yeah, I think you're right. I think it's a lot easier to do it in movies because of the visual help. And it's a conversation, sorry, Susanna, that we had a couple of weeks ago where I've seen it done in comics. Um, if anyone knows Building Stories by Chris Ware, of course, somewhere up there, it's just a big box. And inside the box, there's all these differently physically formatted comics with no reading order. So you just pick the different booklets and through reading them all, you piece together the whole story. So then I gave Susanna away my free idea. If someone could come along and write a story, a fantasy epic or whatever it is, in different booklets from the POVs of different, you know, Game of Thrones, like, but in booklets. And you could make your own reading timeline. And if you're lucky, you might read it chronologically. If you're unlucky, it may come as a flashback and you'll eventually cobble together all the events. Um, but I think we agreed it would require a certain amount of planning and mapping uh, that we didn't really feel like taking on. But I, I would like to see something like that. Um, I, I agree. And I, I haven't, I've seen Cloud Atlas. I haven't read the book. Um, that, that was one of the ones that, that came to mind. I, I definitely need to read it. And I'm interested in that author. Um, I'm blanking on his name right now, but he's definitely David someone Mitchell. who. David Mitchell. There you go, Sorry. David Mitchell, who who likes to experiment a lot with his writing and the structure of his writing and uh, the prose, and and I, I admire that, and that's definitely something I I think I could use more of in my life. Um, Jose, you're totally right that comics do it a lot more too. Like one of the writers who comes to mind, um, beyond Neil Gaiman, who's been mentioned, is Tom King. Mm. Um, who he writes a lot of superhero comics, but a lot of them are like kind of these twelve issue miniseries. Um, and they're often a chronological and you just get like different snippets throughout, but they're the visual cues so that you're never lost. You know where you are in the story. Right. And you're like, it's at the end of the story that you kind of piece together the whole thing. Like, you know, the movie Me Memento. Um, Not and yeah, example. I mean, I guess that's, mm -hmm. yeah. Um, what there was a specific example I was going to mention. I'm totally blanking. Um, someone else start talking. <laughs> <laughs> So yeah, yeah. I, the only thing I would say about no, sorry, no, Steve, um, the only thing I was going to say about Cloud Atlas is that everything that has been said is true, but it's a little bit of a cheat because you go by peeling the layers of the onion, so you fall naturally from one into the next, into the next, into the next. It's not as jumbled up as as it could be. So the. Um, the example I was going to get is, uh, sorry, it just occurred to me, was uh, A Song of Ice and Fire, because it had been mentioned, is actually, it's not done to the same extreme version, but that's sort of what Feast for Crows and Dance with Dragons is, is it's kind of, it's split by location, which is such an arbitrary way of doing it, um, and you don't really get the full story until you've read both books. And mm -hmm. so literally there are versions of the book online you can find where the fans have reassembled it in chronological order, um, where you can see things happening, you know, as, as they happen, um, as opposed to like, you know, reading all of these characters' perspectives and then having, you know, just hearing rumors and not really understanding what's going on or what's motivating some of the, the side characters until then you get to the next book and then see what all these other characters were doing um, at the same time. Mm -hmm. And it's, you know, it's not, again, as extreme as something like cloud outlets or memento or something but they, they're actually i mean i think that's one of the reasons why uh george R. R. martin struggled to write the book so much and continues to is is bringing all of these threads uh together and not losing his path hmm. 
I'm here thinking, yeah, of course there is a version where everything is neatly put together. <laughs> 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 it reads well. Uh, I, I actually, I in my recent reread um, I did earlier this year, it uh, it it flows surprisingly well considering the books weren't written that way. Um, and man, it is one really long book. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Mm-hmm. it's like 2000 pages so I have a speaking of cinema versus uh, writing or books I I, I kind of I, I feel like readers are less less willing to take a risk on something different I think most readers like kind of their genres and they like the predictability of their whatever they prefer Whereas I think, and it, that might that might be because you're investing a lot more time into reading a book, and it takes some, it takes engagement to read and to understand and to process everything. Whereas a movie, it take you know you sit down for two hours, and if you don't like it, you walk away and you do something else. It's, it's a lot less time investment than it is to read. It, it takes a lot less energy, mental and mental energy, to, to watch a movie than to read a book. But I feel like readers are less willing to take a chance on something that's different or that at least is uh, not kind of the same structures are used to. Yeah, I don't know if any of you read my latest rant on the forum about Sleepstream. It's exactly about that. <laughs> yeah. So I, I, I will refer to the forum and not repeat myself. <laughs> <laughs> I well no I go go ahead because I I haven't read it and I think that may be an interesting continuation of the topic. Otherwise, I'm just gonna start rambling about how I feel like it's done in different ways between viewers and mm-hmm. readers because I think viewers are just as conservative in terms of mm-hmm. what they want to watch. Um, but sorry, go go ahead, Jose and Susana. <laughs> no, go ahead, Susanna. Because th- th- no, because this is a continuation of a private conversation that we had, and I feel like I am the culprit of Susanna's latest rant. So, I'll 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 see <laughs> oh. uh, the the word, and then I'll I'll do my best. <laughs> please, please rant. Please, you weren't mentioned, but you're not the culprit. Don't worry. Um, no, it, it, and actually, it's two topics. So the the rant was about uh, slipstream, which is what I write, and I do like to break the story apart in as many pieces as I can. And I'm really trying to push that to the limit. And uh, yeah, and uh, that really upset some readers. They, I've, I've, I've learned that some people, they literally, even when they try, they can't abstract enough. And, and my books are short. I'm not talking about, you know, a thousand pages and long. They are about, you know, 350, 400 pages. But it's still a lot for some people to just keep all that story in their heads. Uh, I am getting better at it, but anyway. But um, it is a risk because I understand, you know, you you sometimes would you just want to read the book and then want to have to think about the book. You just want to, you know, to sit back and enjoy the story. Um, but there are other readers that like that stimulation. Like for me, one of the things that I enjoyed, uh, what I'm enjoying now that I'm rereading A Song of Ice and Fire was particularly that split, which was something that I didn't appreciate the first time I read, you know, 10 years ago when the book came out, because I was just, you know, waiting for the next one. And now reading them back to back, I love seeing where the bits in Dance of Dragons fit, you know, uh, because for me, that is stimulating, that is interesting, that makes me now enjoy the book a lot more. So I was a bit sad when I know there's a version with everything put together. And I'm like, oh, of course there is. <laughs> you know, and it depends on the readers. So it's the rent is mostly about how the hell do I get to those readers? Um, pretty much. Yeah, I was just going to say that, you know, because I after we had that conversation both privately and then on your public rant, I was like, oh, what, what is this slipstream thing? And then obviously... Parameter being parameter, she's going away. I already read twenty books about it uh, <laughs> since three o- <laughs> since three o'clock this afternoon, right? <laughs> but um, the so I've read Hopscotch by Cortaza, and at the time I read it, but I, I I wasn't aware that this genre called slipstream existed. 
my only and for anyone that doesn't know hopscotch is a book that has got like these really tiny chapters that can either be read sequentially or like playing hopscotch and you jump from one to a seemingly random other chapter and then you go back and forth back and forth around the book and the story like i said it can either be read sequentially and split in two parts one part takes place in paris and the other part in buenos aires or you mix everything up according to how Cortázar designed it. I think the issue, and it feels a bit gimmicky, is that, I'm back to drawing the parallel with movies, when Tarantino did Pulp Fiction, cinema had been around for how long? 100 years, if maybe less. It's a fairly less. relatively new medium, and you know, you know, color movies and talkies, even less time than that. When Cortázar arrives and does this funky, weird, crazy novel, books have been around for centuries, mm. for millennia. So the medium is really well established. We all know full well instinctively what a book looks like, how it should be read. You know, you go from one page to the next in sequential order and you get your story. So when you break the mold in such a you know vast way of something that has been you know it's ingrained in us for thousands of years, it's I think it's got that slightly more gimmicky feel. And I'm not talking about the content. I'm not talking about the themes or, or the settings or anything like that. Just the fact that you have to hop around the page or or the books where you got two stories going on, one is on the pages and the other one is hand annotated on the margins and you got two stories running in parallel and things like that, they feel gimmicky rather than innovative. But that's my perception and I'd be happily um, proved wrong by anyone here. Again, it depends on how it's done. To to give another example that I read recently that I was not expecting. So I, I have this kind of pet peeve that I don't like footnotes in books. And uh, my Kindle is like 11, 12 years old. And it, it, most of the time it don't, doesn't even show. And I'm fine with that because I don't want to know any footnotes. That being said, I recently read... Um, Dr. Norrell and, and Mr. Strange. And uh, I immediately realized, well, I'm, I'm going to have to read the footnotes. So I got the audiobook because I couldn't read it. It, it was just too awkward. I would have to kind of flip things around. And it works so well in that book, the footnotes. And the narration is excellent because that's another thing. Uh, whenever an, a narrator has a book with footnotes, it is it is hell, you know that um, often then they have to kind of decide what to do and then how to do it and how to break, and, and and this time was done you know seamlessly so well. And how, so, how did they do it? It just like how do you do footnotes and audio? I can't even imagine. Listen to the it's it's beautiful. It it's just the hmm. change of tone, and you know that it's a footnote, but it doesn't break the narrative at all. Even when it's long footnotes, there, there's some of them that are like they're self-contained short stories, and but it doesn't. Mm. I don't know. It's the writing, the the prose is so perfect that it doesn't break the pace at all, and and that is an exception of a gimmick that actually works. So just because something is gimmicky doesn't mean that it's not going to work. When it's done well, it can work really, really well. I, I, all of you, what you guys just said, I think is really interesting. And Jose, I, I find it, I mean, we keep coming back to Pulp Fiction, right? Um, I mean, cause it's such an obvious example. I, when I first watched it, thought it felt gimmicky. Like I didn't get it. I, 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 I mean, I still don't totally, I, I, you know, understand why that was the approach. Um, beyond certainly it makes the story more interesting than it would have been without it. Uh, just because it, you know, you piece it together, but is that what, what's the fingers? Yeah. I, I heard, I don't know if this is true. I, I, I wish it is true, but I read somewhere back in the day interview that what happened was when he was about to deliver the script, it dropped the pages. They got all scrambled. And then he thought, well, why the hell not? 
I don't know if this if this is one of these urban legends that or you know myths that happen around the the movie, or if it actually happened and he realized what he'd done and figured, hmm, why the hell not? I don't know. I just like it. It's a, a nice story. You see, storytelling. That's a that is, yeah, that is it. That's a great story, apocryphal or not. Um, <laughs> but it, it, go, going back again to what you were saying, Jose, that like. I definitely agree with you that there must uh, some aspect of it um, and, and just the, the feeling of it being gimmicky or not for um, the people who, you know, readers, viewers, what have you is the age of, you know, the, the medium of storytelling, you know, cause I, I think about like going back even further to like, just, just verbal, you know, storytelling. I can't imagine. I mean, I don't know if I've ever, heard of an epic poem or anything like that you know where people hop around you know sequentially like it, it, it's where people really play with structure i mean i guess beowulf does it a, a little bit but not really to the extent that we're talking about it's more sort of like flashbacks you know and not the sort of understanding the meat of the story um as like a puzzle almost um go for it susanna <laughs> It's been a long time since I read it, but there's a um, an epic uh, poem called uh, the Lusíadas. It's a po- by a Portuguese um, writer. It's it's kind of our version of uh, Homer and the Iliad, and I think it does that a bit. It's it's quite epic, and it it, it goes places. Uh, I need to read it again. I'll recommend it to Paramita. See what she thinks. <laughs> yeah. She'll she'll ready yeah. by tomorrow. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but um I think something you touched on, Carl, and I don't know, maybe I'm just taking the conversation somewhere else that is not relevant. But um I think some forms of storytelling are disappearing or have probably disappeared. Hmm. And you know, I think books have got staying power. But, uh, you know, you're talking about the oral traditions. And um, I, I I don't know if this was the case, uh, maybe in Portugal, Susana, but when I'm talking, you know, uh, first half of the 20th century, my before television arrived in Spain. So my grandfather used to tell me, you know, th- they didn't have television. So what you did is that you went to a cafe. And different cafes around the town, I think back in the 40s, he was living in Madrid. So different cafes in Madrid will have different chats. And you would be a member of that chat. And you will go after your lunch and sit around a table with people, drink coffee, and just chat like we're doing now. Hmm. And they will chat and tell stories or jokes or, or whatever. And there was almost this ritual aspect to it that you needed someone to introduce you to a chat group in a cafe, almost like someone had to vouch for you. So my grandfather got introduced into this chat by his older brother, you know, his older brother introduced him formally to this group of people. And then, you know, first day you just sit there and you listen to people talk and then little by little, you know, you are sort of, allowed to take part in the conversation and eventually you become this sort of very local celeb because if you're a good conversationalist people want you in their cafe in their conversation Mm. and then when television arrived progressively that died and different cafes in madrid still have a reputation for being the literary cafes where writers of the time and journalists will go to have their coffee chats in the afternoon Mm -hmm. and the, I, like when I used to hear my grandfather tell me those stories, he's like, I want that. Like I wanted to be a part of that. And I suppose that maybe this thing that we're doing now is the 21st version of what he used to do um, 80 years ago. Hmm. That, 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 yeah, that, that is oral, the point. I, I think the oral tradition, right, it depends on like – if we're talking about it disappearing, it depends on how we're defining it, right? You know, I mean, you could even talk about like going to a religious service, right? And if someone is like orally telling you the tradition, I mean, 
you think even like if if part of the way you define it is like the story changing from the teller and you know that there there is that flexibility and and things like that and and that you know you're not necessarily going to a written source um i i think that's gone in a lot of ways but even then again like how many people actually you know just talking about christianity for example which yeah, i knew growing up with um how many people like actually read the Bible cover to cover versus getting the lessons from their preacher, you know, from a priest, whoever, right. Or, or, you know, what, whatever leader, you know, thought leader they have. Um, and I think that's true, you know, in some ways I think that carries forward that tradition. Um, similarly, you know, I, I, I think debatably audiobooks you know, at least fill part of that whole, right? You know, we're talking about where it, that's a big part of reading today, right? And there's the debate of like, is it reading? Is it not? You know, whatever. Because uh, you're not literally reading, but it's, you know, you are getting the story um, and you get the narrator, which adds so much or, or takes away so much depending on, you know, the way they tell the story. Um, and so I really th think it just comes down to how do you define the oral tradition? Certainly it's changed. And with the internet and everything, it's, it's changed quite a lot. Um, like you were describing Jose, but yeah, I think it all comes down to really how you define it. And you just made me realize how dumb I am because it's, uh, yeah, it's not, I... it's not... <laughs> thank you, Susanna. Thank you. <laughs> um, but it, it hasn't died. And actually, yeah, technology has just changed that. So I was talking to Holly last night and she said that, you know, the books she prefers are biographies. And I've realized actually some of the podcasts that I enjoy the most listening to is where they interview someone with an interesting story, whether it's a sportsman or a politician or an adventurer. And you just listen to two, three hours of these people telling their lived experiences and yeah, obviously it, it hasn't died. It's just on a, in a new shape, and that oral tradition is taking on a a very different shape now. We're not hearing the Nordic sagas, but you can hear name the boxer of your choice from the eighties or the nineties tell his life story, and I find those really really engaging. And you know, whatever musician, whatever floats your boat you can find a two hour conversation somewhere on the internet with that person that you look up to. So yeah, I was very wrong. Uh, it does make you wonder too, how much, like you think of the way that people self mythologize. And I just read a book um, uh, that was a biography of Stan Lee mm. and you know, that his story about himself changed constantly throughout his life. Uh, really wonderful read the um, true believer, the rise and fall of Stan Lee. Um, very uh, educating um, and entertaining. A very, I mean, his story is as interesting. His life story is as interesting as anything he ever wrote. And I, you know, it makes you wonder if, like, in the past, you know, these myths and you know these poems and stuff began in some way. Some of them, at least, as someone or uh, uh, recounting someone's life story, and then they just gradually changed and evolved over, you know, decades, hundreds of years, thousands of years. Uh, I mean, we, we I know Gilgamesh um, was supposed to, like my understanding is historians believe he was a real king, but certainly, you know, we don't believe that the Epic of Gilgamesh was literally his life story. And so, uh, I don't know, yeah, just makes you wonder. Mm. Mm. It's a bit of, of a tangent that I kind of remind. When I first moved here, so the, I'm right in the middle of Ireland, like doesn't get more brutal, brutal than, than this. And there's a pub down the road. You know, it's it's a typical Irish village. You know, there's a church, pub, GEA club, and um, yeah, half a dozen houses. Uh, and they used to do, and this sadly ended with COVID. They haven't done it since. But when I first moved here, they would have like this singing night. And uh, it wasn't, you know, like karaoke or open mic or anything like that. No, it was just a group of old people, elderly, like, you no know, senior citizens, 
uh, they would take turns. <laughs> I don't know how to. Uh, they, they would take turns and each would sing, you know, something. Some in Irish, others in English, I would still be the accents for the life of me. I couldn't understand most of it. <laughs> but um, they, would, they would take turns and they would only do one thing. Um, you, you could tell that there, there was a group of people that were allowed to sing. You couldn't just, you know, uh, burst into song. But there was um, a storytelling going behind that. Like the the theme of one song usually followed the theme of the other, or it was you know, about the same thing or the same person, and it created this 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 chain, this this melody, and it was so uh, uh, such a good environment, and you just getting wrapped in in that uh, yeah I don't know how to describe it, but it was uh, storytelling in but in in in, in song just. Um, so at, at atmospheric and beautiful, and it's a shame that you know after COVID that they, they stopped doing that because it's you know, it's a very crowded small pub. But uh, I guess it's something similar to what Jose was saying to go into the cafe and tell stories. They would go to the pub and sing their stories. Hmm. Which, uh, yeah, sorry, I thought it was beautiful. That's very cool. Yeah, that sounds like an amazing thing to experience. Mm. I miss it. It's that, that lived experience that I think we're drawn to, right? I think at some level, all of us are in, in some way. But I think that's one thing, at least for now, that AI can't do is give us that same experience of listening to an AI-generated story versus someone's story. Whether the AI story would be more interesting or not, I think that lived experience, there's just something about retelling those experiences that you can't really replace the, the day that AI can do that is the day that we should all worry. <laughs> yeah. Be very worried. Because right now there's no soul, hmm. no soul at all. It, yeah. There's, it's, it, it's missing the, the, yeah, that rawness of the human experience definitely. And not necessarily everyone can translate that, but it's, it's something that is definitely the, the core of a lot of the, most powerful and most lasting stories is that raw human experience. Um, I, I, while we're talking about this, it just made me think about how, you know, on the broad topic of storytelling, how much the medium changes a story mm. and the way it can be interpreted. Like I was just even thinking of, you know, how podcasts will be um, transcripted and how so often, you know, or even interviews you'll see in like tabloids, like things will be taken out of context or, um, how you see something that was like clearly someone joking and like you see them live, like they're, they're expressing something as a joke and then suddenly it gets written down and, you know, people are up in arms um, and that the tone entirely changes and that the, the, the very medium of expression um, fundamentally has a huge impact on like the nature of a story and, and the impact of it. You know, I mean, you can talk about audiobook narrators and how much what they bring to a story can improve it or uh, make it, you know, drastically worse, dry as, you know, anything you've ever read. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that would be nerve wracking to, we've talked about this in the forum too, about having, you know, writing a book and then having a narrator who doesn't, ex maybe just doesn't hit the, doesn't hit the, doesn't have the same delivery as maybe you intended it to be. I think that would be nerve wracking for me. Like if, if I were an author looking for a narrator, it'd be, I'd be very, it, it's tough to find someone who would be able to kind of pick up on that same wavelength, I guess you can say to have the same, to have the story delivered the same way you intended it, it with words on a page versus their voice over uh, an audiobook. That'd be, yeah, it'd be tough. Mm-hmm. Have either of you had audiobooks made for your books? Yes. Can you speak to that process? I'm very curious to hear about your experience and like translating your written work into, it, um, you know, the audio medium. Well, I wrote the books with the narration in mind. Um, and I was very lucky. It, it was the easiest and most fortunate aspect of all my writing journey from you know draft to marketing and publication. I was very lucky. I found an amazing narrator, Sarah Campton, 
I interviewed her on a channel last month, a couple months ago. And it, it was one of those things I, I've had. So I used ACX and you put up a sample and then narrators, you can't contact the narrator directly, but I didn't know anyone. So I just put it up there and received auditions. And uh, wow, I, I got very discouraged very soon thinking, well, this is not going to work. Uh, some some of them were really really bad. One I'm I'm not even sure it was human. Um, hmm. And then <laughs> I listened to to her sample and knew exactly that this this is this is the voice this is this is the voice that I was looking for that I couldn't believe. And uh, apparently from her side it was the same. She read and she knew exactly. This seriously she knew exactly. She captured the tone exactly as I wanted, without that, that, that direction whatsoever. Even later with the characters, I only had to give direction in a couple of characters because I, I can't write accents. Um, one had to be American and uh, the other one had to sound like this particular actor for reasons. And uh, so it was the only direction that I, I, I gave her. Everything else she took from the page. She, she then told me that it was the same for her. She read... She understood the tone and that everything else, she, uh, that information was all on the page and she took it from there. And it was the most, all the five books was the most effortless uh, process, even just proofreading. That we, we got it done in, in just a couple of weeks by the end. It was, yeah. So pick your narrator very well. Be patient, you know, I'm sure he's out there, you, you know, they exist. Um, if you can choose... Sometimes if you are traditionally published, you can't. The, the publisher would choose for you, and, and that's that. But it's one of the few advantages of being self-published is that you can choose your narrator. So be patient, choose well, because, yeah, it is worth it. Most of my royalties come from the, the, uh, the audiobooks. So, wow. Yeah. yeah. Excellent. It's an it, it's, uh, excellent narrator, too. Yeah, I can confirm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> really good. The good stuff. It's something that I'm always, um, I haven't gotten to invest in an audiobook yet, but I am afraid, like you were, you know, saying, Steve, about finding, you know, someone could be very talented and still just not be the right fit. I mean, it's like casting an actor, you know, uh, they, they, you could get an Oscar winning actor in there if they just like don't look like the role or they don't sound like the role, you know, they can't get that tone, then it just won't work. Um, and trying to find that perfect fit. I mean, that's wonderful, Susanna, that you, you found someone who just can embody that. Um, Cause that's certainly the thing that when I think about it makes me the most anxious. And I'm just like how I have this very specific idea in mind and it's like, can I, can I find that? Um, but I'm also not someone who listens to a lot of audiobooks, So I I'll admit that I'm helps. Not overly experienced. Yeah. That helps. Even to then just direct to to know which part because you you can't put the whole book. You know, it's a sample. Which bit to choose? All that uh, is important to to help the narrator as well to to then pick the work. Hmm. And knowing while you're, <clears throat> while you're writing, knowing what works on audio and doesn't. Um, and that was something that I only refined, you know, by the third and fourth book. Like the the, the first book, uh, the audio is uh, is slightly different than the book because I realized I had too many dialogue tags in in the first book. You know, the f- first book is always a mess. Okay, um, and <laughs> as I was listening, I realized, well, I don't need all these dialogue tags. So by the second and third book, I managed to. No, then the second book, I had too few. Yeah, that, that was the issue. Even, <laughs> if, if, even Sarah was getting confused on who was talking what. So by the third book, I got it right. <laughs> no, but it, it does help. And, and, and the same thing just cues about the, the tone of voice, how you write the dialogue, the cadence of the words. That, that all informs the narrator how he's going to create that character. And the, the, love- the reader, because some people do have their own narrators, and that helps. I love that your experience with the audiobook narrator was the perfect story structure. You know, <laughs> you had the thesis, antithesis, synthesis. It was just 
<laughs> talking about universal story structures. Mm -hmm. Maybe something um, one of you fancy author people can help me out with, but what's the difference between a narrative and a story or is it the same thing? Because I hear people refer no to it idea. different ways and I wasn't, wasn't sure. Well, uh, good question. Uh, I might be saying something completely wrong. I'm not going to look it up. But to me, <laughs> whenever someone says um, a narration, and you're talking about not necessarily an audio narration, just, yeah, just a, uh, yeah, book or, a, 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 a written account of, of something. Yeah. I think a story needs to have a little bit more of the fictional, if that makes sense, a bit more of the fantastical. A narration is is a bit more grounded. It's a bit more informative, you know, it, it, like the sort of uh, text you would find in a, in a manual when they mm. are trying to teach you something. And the story, even though it can be used for teaching, of course, but it's more entertaining. Off the top of my head, that would be how I would find I might be saying like something completely wrong. I, I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> that we, you know, to discuss semantics, I, I, I don't know. L last time, I showed my complete ignorance, and I still think that maybe words mean slightly different things in different languages. So when we spoke mm. about satire a few weeks ago, mm. I came out as totally ignorant about it. But I think that satire in Spanish and satire in English aren't necessarily exactly the same thing. So I, I don't know. Hmm. Yeah, I don't know how I would differentiate them. Um, it, I, I mean, I do have have the feeling that, like a lot of synonyms, you know, they don't mean the exact same thing. They just mean similar things. Um, but I, you know, off the top of my head, I don't know exactly where I would differentiate. Sure. As opposed to something like plot, you know, where I feel like I, I could lay out like a difference um, between that and like story or, or narrative or anything like that. Hmm. And so kind of on that same wavelength is the uh, story, story structures, like the different acts. Is that something that all of you try to maintain in your work to have like, a certain structure do you do you kind of follow those rules or do you kind of tell the story the way you want to tell it that's a great question or do you just naturally fall into that structure because that's what we're used to depends in my experience every story is different and i've written countless screenplays and i think they i tend to like go a little more like traditionally structural with a lot of them um you know, like writing a TV pilot is very different than writing a movie. Um, the structure is different because, you know, it's part one um, as opposed to a movie that theoretically, I mean, I, I guess even that can vary, right? Because Fellowship of the Ring, I don't know that it has a complete arc. Um, as like, I'm sure there's someone out there who disagrees with me. But, you know, you, you go back to the original books, Tolkien wrote them all as one big book. Um, so... Yeah, it definitely varies depending on the project. Even in the series I'm writing, I'm writing book two right now, and the structure of it's going to be different than book one. Book one I wrote to be like a five-act tragedy, um, and I didn't come to that naturally. I, I went into it just like freeballing it, um, and it I, I, I wasn't – all I knew is I didn't want to do the classic Hollywood three-act structure because I'd been getting hammered with that for so long, mm. and – what I ended up coming to was I read a book um, into the woods um, that tried to sort of prescribe that everything is actually in five acts. And I thought that that was reductive, but I did think, oh, you know, Shakespeare didn't intend to write his stories, his plays in five acts, but we sort of found that they all fell into that. Like it was just kind of the structure that seemed um, natural to him. And, and there's a difference between the five act structure and three acts, which happy to 
go into. Um, and then I was looking at my book as I was rewriting it and I was like, oh, that's the structure. I mean, that's already what I'm sort of uh, homaging in many ways is kind of a classical tragedy. And so I was like, I should lean into that 100%. And so on subsequent rewrites, I, I intentionally sort of, I, I didn't do it in like a hard, like beat by beat by beat sort of way. You know, each chapter is its own, kind of has its own structure. Um, but in terms of like arcing out the individual acts, I definitely uh, leaned into that. And then in book two, now I'm trying a three act structure. Uh, ironically, I'm going back to, although it's not quite, um, I, what I would say is it definitely falls into one of Vonnegut's structures. Mm -hmm. um, but that wasn't necessarily intentional. It just, I felt like I, I knew where the second book needed to go in a broad strokes. Um, I don't outline. Um, well, that's not entirely true. I try to outline and I inevitably don't go anywhere near it. Um, <laughs> but I know where like the story is broadly going and I know what needs to broadly happen in book two. And so as I was writing, I was just like, this fits into a three act structure. This is definitely not five acts. Um, and it definitely isn't the four act structure. We're talking about briefly, Jose mentioned, you know, kind of the different ways of telling stories um, in the East. And uh, kind of the most famous version of that is the, uh, I think it's the Kisho Tenketsu. I have it pulled up mm -hmm. um, because I was thinking about it when you talked about it. Yeah, Kisho Tenketsu, which is its own four act structure um, that, you know, you can, you can see in a film like uh, Parasite, um, which phenomenal film if everyone hasn't seen it. It's, it won the best picture and deservedly so, um, unlike any movie I've ever seen. But you know, I knew it wasn't book two wasn't that. And so I just kind of, uh, was looking at it and I was like, you know, as much as I chafe against, um, wanting to give in to certain traditional structures at, at sometimes it's just the right answer. Um, so that was my long meandering answer for that. <laughs> <laughs> How, uh, just a side track, cause I, I'm kind of like you, I, I, I can't, I can't plot for the life of me. I've, I've had conversations <clears throat> With Livia because she, she she's like plot programmer master, trying to to learn the trick because my my my, my plotting is just bullet points, and I sometimes can't even follow that. You know it, it's it's ridiculous. So uh, how how do you then figure it out the the structure because it's a sort of saying you can just write endlessly and meander meander meander. What do you do to kind of rein in and create a story beginning to end? rewrite <laughs> a lot <laughs> yes yeah my uh the the dean of the um screenwriting program i went to um former dean i don't think he still is um or not the dean whatever that the head of the program uh wrote a book called uh screenwriting is rewriting mm -hmm. and I'll, i confess i was supposed to read the whole thing i did not <laughs> but uh that's a lot of college um but I have found that that has been true for me is just that at the end of the day, I'm not someone who can like write a first draft and it's, it's like there, even though I rewrite endlessly as I'm going, I have to like have the full picture, like just, just write, write it, decide, okay, this is the ending. This is where I generally knew I was getting to. I've had a climax that came out wrong. <laughs> um, and, uh, and that now I need to find a way to like structure this appropriately. Um, and on that, uh, Word flow. I'm gonna let someone else talk. <laughs> I'm gonna read your book. I'm curious now. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Likewise, I'm I'm curious to check out everyone. There's so many wonderful people. So, so many. I just got Janny uh, Wurtz's first um, Wars of Light and Shadow book. I'm excited to dive into it. It's good stuff. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We we know what you meant, Carl. It's okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I figured everyone would follow, but as it, uh, it was one of those cases where as it came out of my mouth, I was like, oh, that was a thing that I just, I just said. Um, but you know what? That's, that's storytelling, baby. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's how I write, by the way, is it's all just like you, words just come out. And then I realized, oh, wow, that was, I guess that was a joke or that was a thing that just happened. Time to write based off of that. Um, yep. What about you, Jose? What's what's your? How do you write? 
Oh, God. No. I... He, he lulls you into a state of, you know, near boredom and then <laughs> drops the most unexpected twist or, you know, bleak, horrible thing out of the blue on you. And uh, that m- makes then perfect sense with the stuff you were reading before, but you don't realize that until it happens. But uh, it, it waits until the right moment where you're just, just almost getting bored with it, then bam. That's how it writes, isn't it? <laughs> if you say so, if you say so. Um, I've always felt that more than writing and perpetrating stories. Um, um, mostly, I mean, I've written two novels that those are nowhere in sight. The, the short horror story collections are somewhere out there. But, you know, Steve was talking about structure. It's a short story. So it's all very lean. Most of the time, it's very linear. I'm just going beginning to end because, like Susanna mentioned, I'm going for that uneasy, queasy, you know, nasty twist at the or unsettling twist at the end. But sometimes it's, it's the form in which the narration takes. It may be some sort of a pistolar exchange between characters. Um, Maybe you are mixing in newspaper article cutouts with with the narration, so so I can play a little bit with the form at times. More often than not, it's a first person um, narration. It's a it's a first person recollection of events um, type thing. Although I've always found that what. Well, Sometimes felt that first-person narration tends to s- take away a little bit from the tension because you know that person is going to be there at the end because they are the ones telling you the story. So then I need to think about where the twist is going to is going to come from. But I, I think short stories you're a bit more constrained because you're just trying to get from point A to point B. Um, and I think you're more for an effect rather than having a play with the, with the medium and the structure, although that's still possible. Hmm. It's interesting you mentioned, you know, the different ways of like writing a book versus writing a, a sh- short story, which I'm way less experienced with. I'm actually writing my first comic, um, collaborating with this artist um, in this anthology. And um, it's a horror short story and it, it functions in the same way, like uh, off basically a twist at the end right um which which actually is basically almost the the t show uh oh my god i'm gonna mispronounce it i have this pulled up uh kisho tenketsu structure is like that's it, it all is built around a twist um where it's the four acts are introduction development twist and then conclusion and that it's you know really it's about um it's been described as like a conflictless structure which is i think not accurate. I, I think it just depends on how people define conflict, but um, it's missing the sort of like traditional second act, you know, where you have all of the like, you're constantly, you know, people are fighting and um, the romance is being challenged and, and that sort of thing. Um, where, you know, you're, you're, you enter a story, you see it, you know, the, the world developed a bit and then something very dramatic happens and then you deal with that. Um, and I feel like a lot of short stories fall into that, um, you know, structure, uh, maybe, um, unintentionally where they're not necessarily, you know, I, I've heard a lot of people talk about, uh, short stories as being like just the third act of the story, even, you know, or like, or just the second act. It's like, you've cut off, um, the rest of the story. It's like a piece of a larger story and you just get that one piece of it and like plop it in. Um, and it definitely just means that like fundamentally, um, because you're constrained in the space, you have to tell the story differently. Um, it's an interesting thing. Yeah, I definitely agree. It's, it's a totally different approach when you set out to write a short story than when you give yourself the space to just wander and meander, um, it affects the way you approach everything. But um, um, you know, I think I, I've, I'm not tra- I'm not a trained writer. I haven't, you know, I 
my background is just that I enjoy reading. Um, and, and that's it, really. Sometimes I feel very unqualified to join this conversation. Cut it out. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's true. It's true. Like, like, I, I, you know, um, I don't, I don't, I, yeah, I, I, I haven't got a formal background or education in it. So when you know, we're talking about certain things, you, you were talking about difference between narration and story or whatever. I, I, no, I haven't got a clue, mate. Yeah, you, know, you know what? You were right. I, I Google it. It's pretty much just semantics. So you, mm-hmm. you got it right. I was just, you know. <laughs> creating a story with it. But, uh, there you go, yeah. <laughs> but, but this thing of, uh, of background, uh, it, it doesn't, I don't think it necessarily makes anyone, you know, qualified. I mean, we are all readers, mm-hmm. you know, and, you know, and, and you write as well. So, I mean, my background, my ed- ed- education is in psychology, which comes very handy for character creation, but you know, it's not something. Uh, maybe, maybe I should put on my bio. You know, maybe, maybe it would help. Um, but I, like you, I, I kind of I don't mention often because because I'm, I'm afraid that would just people think that it, it's just gonna because the main character is psyche, and I was like, well, they're gonna think that it's just gonna be some psychological stuff, in, and it's not. So I, I put it away. But even if I hadn't written anything, I've read books all my life. I love to read. I mean, I, I think I know a little bit about stories and, and characters and plot and prose to have an opinion about it. And uh, thank you, Steve, for letting me have an opinion about it uh, <laughs> this way. So. There is a... It's all good. Well, uh, uh, Forgot, no, no, I, think, com- uh, really qu- uh, I think it was. An, I think I watched. Op- I think it was an Oppenheimer because I watched that a few days ago. But one of the lines from it was um, something to the effect of, "It doesn't matter if you can read the music; it's if you hear the music." It kind of maybe think of this mm-hmm. conversation because you, you may not be able to to you know explain, but you just you just know it when you see it or when you read it or watch it. So I think you know this. Storytelling is like pornography. Is what we're getting out of this. <laughs> How did we end up there? Sorry for, we for, started for the there. not. I don't know if you guys know this, but uh, I, I this is true. Um, I for the non-Americans, I don't know if you know it, but then you know it when you see it came from this. Uh, I want to say it was a member of Congress who they were trying to judge uh, pornography. He was asked to define it. And he says, I don't know how to define it, but I know it when I see it. Uh, I was trying to like, you know, censor pornography. So that's where that Mm -hmm. saying comes from. Um, Mm -hmm. Interesting. Okay. Um, Going off of the the background thing, I mean, I, I, I have a formal education in it, but it's not, I don't think it's necessary. Exactly. I think uh, you were so wonderfully, spoke to it, Steve, that like you, if you can hear the music, you know, then you can speak to the music, even if you don't have, I mean, it comes down to semantics. I think the education is just in semantics, really. It's not like a science where you have to understand, you know, I I think that's the thing with art is it's just, it's as emotional as it is anything. So it really does come down to just your own experience. And if you've experienced, if you've lived and you've experienced stories, then you can speak Mm -hmm. to them, even if you don't have, you know, whatever academic uh, phraseology, you know, down in your soul. It's like that, that ultimately doesn't matter as much as being able to speak to the emotional experience of storytelling. Mm -hmm. Exactly. So there. (laughs) Exactly. So there. (laughs) (laughs) And I, you you know what, I want to interject and, I, which I've done a lot. Um, apologies if I've never yeah, talked too it. much, but um, speaking to Steve, who you know is our relatively quiet leader, um, <laughs> Steve, you always undercut yourself uh, in terms of like what you can add to a conversation. But you read as much as anyone, mm-hmm. you know as well as anyone, and I'm always curious to hear what you have to say. Um, that again, it doesn't take you don't have to write a book to be able to talk about books. Um, you know, e- even an individual author's work i mean there's uh, talks about you know the author is dead which i think is a complicated discussion isn't as simple as you know 
anyway, um, unless the author is literally dead, in which case they're just, you know, rotting in the ground. Um, but it, it's, <laughs> you know, you, what you bring to a, 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 a work of fiction is what you bring to it. And I think, you know, you can bring unique insights uh, regardless of, you know, how well educated you are in story structure or what have you. I, I even think it makes for a better conversation. This would be very dull if it was just, you know, a bunch of academics talking about, you know, and here's the See, the difference between, you know, just an account or telling a story. It's also, it helps to have storytellers to meander and, you know, make jokes along the way, you know. It's humor and little digressions and, and even just the perfections of the narrative you know you can follow the arc the structure but sometimes i at least for me i find it interesting when something slightly deviates from that norm you know i think the the stories that do stand out they have uh, you know the w2f moment but it doesn't seem to fit and it's usually the thing that people will remember uh, i mean you can't do everything by the book hmm. Hundred percent, agree. Hundred percent. It's it, it. It is those, the ways a story is unique, even in little ways. The ways it meanders. You know, the little insights the author has when they bring in their own personal mm -hmm. experiences. That's what makes it really come alive, mm -hmm. and, and often is what makes it really touching. You know, I mean, talking about um, Stephen King, and I mean, there's a lot you can you can critique or compliment in his writing, but I think it's the specific way he speaks to fear. And, you know, the experience of living in a small town in America and particularly a small main town. And, uh, you know, it, it, it's that specificity that adds so much color to his works. You know, I think about it, which is, you know, I think to so many people overwritten, it's a thousand pages long and it just goes on and on about the town of Derry and its history. But it, it is those tangents that like makes the book really come alive mm. to me um that you just you learn so much and it really makes the town feel like a living breathing organism um in a frightening way quite frequently um and i think you know we're learning whale facts in moby dick right like even when they're not true and and they're not scientifically accurate it's still like it adds uh this it's the soul of the story really Does that bother any of you when the, someone adds facts, facts to the story and it's not factual? <laughs> it's just, does that bother any of you? Uh, no. Well, it depends yes. on, on, on what I'm reading. Um, you know, like a little, uh, I wouldn't call it anachronisms. Uh, I, it does upset me a bit if I'm reading fantasy, I don't know, in a proper fantasy setting, you know, medieval, and uh, then suddenly, you know, the, the characters start talking, you know, with uh, modern slang and, uh, and expressions that really, you know, once in a while, you know, if there's a specific character that there might be a reason or a situation for that uh, to happen, sure, but when when it's, I mean, I, it's it's one of the things why I hate retelling so much. Um, <laughs> not gonna go there, but uh, yeah. But if it's if it's a fact that you know it's a fact within the fiction of the story, I don't mind that. You know, if it makes sense. I feel I feel the same way. It, it really depends. I think, it, it, yeah, really depends. Hmm. It does bother me if it's a blatant mistake or if it's like blatantly wrong. And I've got, it comes to mind, back again to movies, is one of the mm, Mission Impossible movies. I think it's the second one where the first introduction set piece takes place in Spain, in Seville. And it's just Hollywood's take. They've taken 
all the quintessentially Spanish traditions from different regions and just shop them all together in this one town. <laughs> and maybe for someone the other side of the Atlantic from me, oh, that's what they do in Spain. For us, it was insulting because it just showed a blatant ignorance of our culture and what was appropriate for where they were and what really was just like, you've taken this bit from here, this bit from there, and just pretend that you know, Spain is this uniform thing. And that's just an example, but if I'm reading a book or watching a movie or whatever, and I can see blatant sort of factual mistakes or anachronisms, it does bother me because it just, you know, do your research, I suppose. And if you've made this mistake, what else, what other mistakes have you made? I definitely agree when it feels like something is misrepresented that should in some way be like real, you know, like I, I think of like, similarly, I come from um, Oklahoma, you know, flyover country in the US. And um, I, I find that it's often when it appears in movies, it's nothing like, I mean, I grew up in Oklahoma City, which is the biggest city in the capital of Oklahoma, but it, it, it often is nothing like what Oklahoma is actually like, um, or, you know, but then you have situations where it's like the wild west and, you know, um, it's intentionally not, you know, real. It, 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 it exists in its own kind of fantasy land. Um, or, you know, getting fat, I talking about facts, right? Like in my book, the doctors, they're meant to be relatively good doctors, but they talk, talk about things in terms of like the theory of humors. Um, and you know, which is what was just taken as like gospel, um, for hundreds of years in Europe. Um, but it's not even remotely scientifically accurate. Um, so I think it, it really depends, you know, I, I think on a lot of the context of things and, you know, Shakespeare's plays are anachronistic and I can't say a lot of the anachronisms particularly bother me. Um, but you know, to some way, in some ways, I think it also is just like you accept what you've already known, you know, like, I, I've lived with Shakespeare, so I don't necessarily question his anachronisms versus like, you know, if someone were to retell one of his stories and they added, I mean, I guess you can, you can intentionally retell it in a different time, but I don't know. I, I think there's a lot of variance. What about you, Steve? Nothing breaks immersion <laughs> more for me than when someone in like a fantasy book like Susanna said, uses like modern slang. Mm, I, yeah. I, That's a pet peeve of mine too. I'm, yeah. I'm my mind goes other places and it's like, this doesn't make any sense. It just really irritates me and I'm, I'm out. <laughs> I'm not like, I don't <laughs> DNF or anything. Well, sometimes I do, but it, it isn't an immediate DNF, but it is really annoying because I mean, you know, I don't know. What are those things? Even in science, in some science fiction too, and if you know uh, some science fiction oh. stories too, it just it breaks that immersion for me. I have a very good example of that. I'm, I'm not shit. Sorry, I'm not gonna. Uh, <laughs> I'm not gonna try and even take the book from the shelf because you know, accidents happen, or try to find the passage. But uh, talking about the Empire of the Vampire. Mm. Uh, uh, I, I might be wrong by not remember it, you know, the words exactly, but it, it was filled with anachronisms, and, and it really ruined it for me because otherwise it would have been a great story. But it, there was one in particular, something about uh, taking it to the rafters, something like that, uh, which I think it's a sports term, that it didn't fit anywhere. In any aspects, why the hell? Um, and it, 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 it's filled with those. And um, yeah, it was, it was very dis disappointing because of it. And, and I know it's the author style, and it did the same thing, similar things in, in Nevernight. But for some reason, in Nevernight, the first book, it didn't, it didn't bother me so much because it was a bit more uh, YA ish. It wasn't taken so serious, you know, but with this one. I know it's there because you know, I, I got a nice edition and everything because I had high hopes. And it really annoyed me. 
I was almost almost at every chapter. It's like, why, why, why? I've never been more disappointed reading a book than I was Empire of the Vampire. Oh. I it it in on so many ways it's everything I want from a book. Like yep. like what I've been looking for yep. in a book that I have not found elsewhere. But I can't get over his writing style. And it's so distinct and like credit to him. Like he has this very distinct voice, mm. but it is so melodramatic that I just can't like even beyond gothic fantasy like I like I think of like classic gothic fiction which is written in a very melodramatic style and I it's still like is somehow way beyond like everything is described in terms of like blood and death and like and then yeah and then there are all the anachronisms and it's just like he's wildly successful so like all credit to him and he clearly like he has his audience but for me personally it was like there's so much here I should like I mean, it's like the, the, the plot itself and the characters, I'm like, I love this. This is what I want. And like the kind of the, that gothic fantasy atmosphere, I'm like, this is, this is it. But the prose, I just couldn't do. It, it was just so, I got halfway through and I just couldn't anymore. Mm. The NF did. Hey, the end, oh, I, I, I got it until the end. I'm very proud of myself. But yeah, it, it, was, it was one of those rage reads. It was the, why, why are you doing this? Why, why? <laughs> a rage read sanderson <laughs> sanderson frustrates me in that way too where i mean i think there's a lot you can criticize about his prose but it's the modern way that his character his characters aren't even consistently talking in a modern way like they, they will at times talk like they're in kind of a classic fantasy novel and not like in a very sort of archaic formal style and other times they will talk like they're like modern sitcom characters and it drives me nuts and i like his books generally like it, it doesn't break it for me it's not so extreme it does um well some of his books more than others but it, it just drives me nuts and it's like a common thing in fantasy these days i feel like a lot of um published fantasy that just like the voice is so distinctly modern and in a very specific type of modern and it is just so for me personally like disconnected from the rest of the book and the environment um like if, if a character's talking like a modern you know teenager or sitcom character I just, and they're you know in a pseudo 15th century world it's like i uh, <laughs> hard for me to like connect mm -hmm. the verisimilitude is just broken completely mm -hmm. yeah but you know, it's, uh, it's getting late for those of you on the other side of the globe, so don't want to keep you up too late. But I think there's more we can we'll, – we'll decide on, on next week's topic, but be fun to uh, to explore a few more ideas for the for the next few. We had a tie on the on the poll. We had to break the tie somehow, so we'll, uh, mm -hmm. we'll figure out the next one. No one wants to talk about reviews. I know. I was surprised. <laughs> I think reviews would be fun. Yeah. there's I have thoughts on reviews many thoughts <laughs> reviews <laughs> i'm up for it yeah yeah we should do it i'd love to hear all your your, your thoughts steve i yeah but we'll save it for <laughs> so, i have thoughts uh probably not very popular but i have thoughts anyway but in the meantime until we get to the juicy stuff we'll uh we'll talk again soon so Susanna, where can people find you and your work uh my work is available pretty much everywhere um amazon combo audible um Barnes and Noble. yeah it's out there you'll find it i can be found these days on x or the page chewing forums mostly and you have or youtube yes you have how many days left on your 365 day challenge you're almost there right three days three days, three days left almost nice. there wait what's what's the challenge uh, to take a picture a day for a year. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, yeah. it's been something on uh, Vero. Yeah. Very cool. Yeah, I'm going to start it up again here on uh, New Year's Day. So we'll do it all over again. <laughs> we'll see. Good luck. Yeah. But, uh, and Jose. Uh, I can be found on my YouTube channel, which is uh, Jose's Amazing Worlds and lurking around indeed page to informs and you have lots of live streams coming up lots of uh interviews coming too uh, yeah it just got a little bit ridiculous this december um sorry uh 
shameless self plug here, but um, check out my interview with author Holly Tinsley from last night. I think it's the best conversation I've had online. Um, talking to Holly about her process and how she decided to become an author and how she went about it is really insightful for anyone who is an indie author or thinking to become one or give it a go. It was fantastic. It was one of those where I would just ask a question and off she would go and just, you know, brilliant, brilliant person to talk to. It was really, really good. How, how, it's yeah. amazing. I'm excited to check. Holly is great, but we'll try not to take that personally. We'll say. <laughs> <laughs> and, and Carl. <laughs> you can uh, find me on most social media sites at Carl D. Albert. Um, you can find me on the page chewing forum if you really want to connect with me more personally. And then uh, my book, my debut, Truth of Crowns, is available in print wherever books are sold. Um, and the ebook is available on Amazon. It's actually 99 cents, part of a big indie book sale going on this weekend. So if you want to check it out, uh, ebook is 99 cents, another shameless uh, self promotion. Yeah, get it out there. Promote away. So until next time, hope everyone has a great weekend and we will talk very soon. Bye, everybody. Till next right. time. Bye.